There's a new game that has consumed my time and thoughts over the past few weeks. I just can't get it out of my head because it's working for me, like really, really working for me. But I couldn't figure out why. Cassette Beast is a fresh indie take on the monster taming formula. Think Pokemon, but more complex in a meaningful way. If you grew up on Pokemon, but maybe felt that those games didn't grow with you, Cassette Beast might make you feel like you did when you were a kid. This is a game clearly made by people who love Pokemon, but know what that series is lacking. They know the little things that grate on you, and they've played the other monster taming games and found all the best mechanics that Pokemon's never explored. They know what makes a monster design enjoyable, and they have their own unique twist on that formula. And most importantly, they know all the parts of a game that often get ignored, like writing, music, and visual juice, and they've elevated cassette beasts in ways that you might not expect. So if you've been looking for a game like that, I think this one might be for you. It certainly is for me, and I think I finally know why that is. Last year, I played both new Pokemon games, Pokemon Legends Arceus and Pokemon Violet. Both of these games purported to shake up the Pokemon formula. Legends Arceus made itself unique by doing away with several core pieces of the franchise that had been there since the mid to late 90s, embracing an exploration-focused open zone structure with Pokemon wandering around the overworld, and taking the player to the Pokemon world's unknown past. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet did so by adapting that long-standing Pokemon game structure to a fully open world, and also allowing Pokemon to roam about the overworld. But as I've said before on this channel, Pokemon Legends Arceus is the game that worked for me, whereas I've turned on Pokemon Violet twice since starting it on launch day. It's no secret to me why this is the case. Pokemon Legends Arceus trades the focus on battling Pokemon for a focus on catching them, the mechanic that I find to be far more interesting. I've never been in love with Pokemon battle systems. I'm generally not a fan of turn-based combat, especially when it's as mechanically simple as Pokemon can be sometimes. Even the battles that Pokemon Legends Arceus does require of you are improved in some ways. They include things like fighting styles, which is a mechanic I personally first encountered when trying out Monster Hunter Stories, another monster catching game that didn't really stick for me. This adds something to what I find to be an overly simplistic style of combat, or at least one that hasn't had any real meaningful changes since its inception in Pokemon Red and Green. But as well as the things that Legends Arceus removed, it added to the formula as well. I wouldn't say that Pokemon Legends Arceus is extremely well written, but among the company of other more mainline Pokemon games, I certainly find it to be better. You play a protagonist dropped into the ancient Hisuia region, a place where Pokemon are not kitschy, cutesy pets, but instead are monsters that the people of Jubilee Village fear. Venturing out into Hisui's open zone world means taking on a measure of risk, and that hook was enough for me. It placed me in that environment better than any setup in a mainline Pokemon game ever has. Again, I don't know that I'd say that Pokemon Legends Arceus has great characters. Most of its leads fall into well-trodden tropes from Pokemon and anime history more generally, but having a sense of fear, of awe, rather than an empty desire for adventure was, I think, the innovation. That fear was the foundation of what I can only describe as a vibe. I use that word a lot on this channel, and today I want to try and define what I mean by that. Because Cassette Beasts, much like Pokemon Legends Arceus, gripped me. And it wasn't the innovative battle mechanics, or the creature designs, or the characters, or the music, or any aspect of this game alone. It was something woven into each of those things, into every part of this game. Because what kept me tuned into Cassette Beasts was the vibe. Cassette Beast is a game modeled after Pokemon. I know that some of you watching are probably already like, hey Matt, other monster catching games exist. And you would be right. Shin Megami Tensei, its sister series Persona, Yokai Watch, Koromon, Monster Sanctuary, Pal World, Temtem, Ooblets, Monster Hunter Stories, Dragon Quest Monsters, and even Dragon Quest V all do some version of monster taming and battling. Pokemon is by far not the only and not the first monster tamer, but it is the most popular. It's literally the largest media franchise in the world, grossing $88 billion since 1996. But going beyond that, Jay Bayless, one half of Bitten Studio, the studio behind Cassette Beasts, said on the pre-order bonus podcast that one of the reasons he and his dev partner Tom Coxon chose to make a game modeled after Pokemon was explicitly because of its marketability. They saw an audience of people who, like me, had grown tired of a series that they'd clearly grown beyond, and said, hey, 
I think I can make something you'd enjoy. Now, cassette piece is not simply a money grab, and if it were, I doubt I'd be throwing around words like vibe. Cassette piece clearly comes from people who love and enjoy a Pokemon style monster taming game and want to see the genre expanded upon. Jay has said in several interviews I've listened to that he and Tom wanted to build cassette beasts for adults, and that meant reimagining a lot of what makes a Pokemon game work. The example he gave was how when you really give any thought to what's actually happening in your typical Pokemon game, the unfortunate similarities to dogfighting are blatantly obvious, if unintentional. That was something the team needed to solve, and the way they did that was by having the human characters transform into monsters rather than sending monsters out to fight each other. Not only does it solve the unfortunate implications, but it introduces an emotional element to battles. It's no longer just your monster friends out there fighting. It's you. Layer on the game's monster fusion mechanic, and you have two human characters fusing into one. Something that's been used to great storytelling and character building effect in media like Dragon Ball Z, and more seriously, Steven Universe. Here, the writing about fusion is closer to the latter. Fusion is intimate. It's maybe sexual. It's described as something shared between two companions whose, quote, hearts beat as one. That single change of recording and transforming instead of catching and fighting immediately adds a layer of meaningful complexity, of maturity, to a formula millions of people have only experienced in a game made for children. It's a new mechanic that comes with meaning. It establishes a vibe. And Cassette Beast has more where that came from. Do I need to explain what an isekai is? You know what, I'm gonna do it anyway. Isekai is a genre or a trope where the protagonist of a story is trapped in another world of some sort. Think The Wizard of Oz, the Super Mario Brothers movie, or the original Digimon series, or Sword Art Online. I mean, if you've seen Sword Art Online, you probably already know what an Isekai is. And like all of those stories, the protagonist of Cassette Beasts, your player-created character, washes up on Harbor Town Beach in a place called New Wirral. Not so strangely, this is nearly identical to how Pokemon Legends Arceus begins. Now, in a typical one of these stories, the main character would be dropped into this new world, maybe get some new powers, and be amazed by how spectacular and different this unexplainable new place is. And those things do happen. But the difference is that everyone else on New Wirral, well, at least most of them, are also from other places. They inexplicably showed up on this island just like you did, from their own separate worlds with all kinds of differences. Felix came from a world where zoetropes had more cultural significance than comic books. Meredith comes from the 1980s, and when she finds an album from her favorite band on New Wirral, the lyrics and song titles are different from the ones that she remembers from back home. And here, on this island named New Wirral, in a world no one quite understands or knows the size of, the residents are transforming into monsters in order to survive and explore. And also, they're working together to build a society, one that's gonna be different from the places that they've come from, by necessity. Now, there's a tendency to speculate about the afterlife in these kinds of stories, and Cassette Beast certainly invites that theory. One character no longer has a scar on their arm that was there before they came to the island, for example. But also, there's a new generation of people that were born here on New Wirral. Would the afterlife include children? The thing is, Cassette Beast isn't really interested in giving those answers. In fact, the core of the game, transforming into beasts using cassette tapes, it's never explained. One of the characters in Harbortown explicitly tells you that it's not something you should really bother looking for an explanation for. These questions exist as a way to develop characters, to improve gameplay, to keep you interested in the world, and to establish a vibe. I've listened to a lot of interviews with Jay Bayless, if you can't tell, and one thing that he makes sure to get across is that the game tells you everything it knows. What you read into that is up to you. Sure, you encounter various rangers across New Wirral with the names of famous philosophers who deliver slightly tweaked versions of real quotes from those philosophers. And sure, you'll encounter a group of what are first thought to be vampires, but you learn are actually land keepers, a group of soulless real estate speculators intent on introducing a housing market and a financial system to New Wirral that it doesn't need. You might notice the game's opening quote from Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and recognize all of the names tied into the game's main threads that are clearly based on or directly taken from Arthurian tales. But those philosophers are just references. The land keepers are just a wink and a nod to Jay's politics. The namesakes of the certain characters and the island itself are simply nods to Jay's hometown of Wirral in England and to Wirral Forest in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. But I'm not convinced that any of this leads up to the game saying anything. 
And as a person who really loves when a game says something and sometimes gets a big head about enjoying that kind of thing, that leaves me a bit uncomfortable. Like, I personally read into these things a story of collectivism, an opportunity to build something new and different than what came before, a story about letting go of things you can't have and that don't serve you, and taking care of the people right in front of you. And that's fine, but according to the people that made the game, it's just not that deep. Cassette Beasts is art meant to evoke feelings, to set a vibe, and that can be enough. It's clearly enough for me, I wouldn't be making this video if I didn't adore this game. So what's so good about it anyway? Well, for me, there's three things. You know when you're trying to catch a Pokemon and you need to weaken it so it'll be easier to catch? And you know the disappointment of accidentally doing too much damage and knocking that Pokemon out before you can catch it? It's the absolute worst. Cassette Beast solves that. In Cassette Beast, you enter every battle with your partner, one of the game's several companions that you can switch between at any point. And this means that every battle, no matter how many monsters you're up against, is a dual battle. This immediately solves a lot of the more frustrating aspects of Pokemon combat for me. But one of those is that you can have one of your characters continue to weaken a monster while the other records it. And if you do, in fact, accidentally reduce its HP to zero while attempting to record, the monster won't be knocked out. You can try again. As long as you're attempting to record that monster, it'll never die. Cassette Beast seems obsessed with making monster taming games feel better in the ways Pokemon will always ignore. Moves in this game are stickers you put on a cassette tape. They're treated like inventory items you can move between your monsters. And gone is a four move limit. Most monsters in Cassette Beast start with six sticker slots and they gain more as they're upgraded. Hell, some stickers even have a plus one slot attribute that adds a sticker slot to the tape they're stuck to. This game also gives you so much information at all times. You can see how likely a recording is to succeed. If you want to leave an encounter, your cassette player will tell you how likely it is you'll be able to flee. This game relies on a chemistry and buff debuff system rather than the hidden type-based stat modifiers that Pokemon does. And the best part is that if a move you're about to use will apply some effect on a monster, the game shows you what that effect is gonna be with a little icon as you highlight the monster you're going to use it on. That way I avoid using fire moves on a water monster and giving it a healing buff. Cassette Beast wants you to love playing it. It wants you to have a good time at all times, and the quality of life improvements and battles are the first time I haven't been actively bored by standard pick-a-move turn-based battles. These battles are not quite as, but nearly as engaging as tactics-style battles for me. One of the best parts of the battles is fusion. Fill up your fusion meter and you and your partner will fuse, becoming a combo of the monsters both of you were transformed into. It's reminiscent of those viral Pokemon fusions, something Jay Bayless said he and Tom were very much inspired by. There's just so much here to sink your teeth into. There's a complexity that doesn't overwhelm, but instead keeps you engaged. And that's not even to mention the music in this game. The battle music goes so hard and is infinitely listenable. In fact, I've been listening to it in the car every day and I'm actively listening to it while writing this video. The thing that absolutely blew me away was that the music is not just situational background music. In certain scenarios, there's actually lyrics. When you fuse with your partner during a battle, you'll hear Shelby Harvey's killer belt serenading you as you kick some ass. When you move from outside to inside in Harbor Town, the melody of wherever we are now will seamlessly transition from an appropriate instrument to Shelby's voice. The songs are cozy in the right places. They go hard when you're in battles. They're mysterious when you're exploring the game's darker corners. And they're produced like a game with a budget much larger than this game likely had. But it reminds me of how I felt about Darren Korb's soundtrack for Hades. It's a video game soundtrack, but it's not video gamey. It's hard to overstate how important voice is to my experience of this game. Hearing Shelby Harvey's voice for the first time when walking into the Gramophone Cafe genuinely shocked me. It adds a character to the Cassette Beast world that he didn't expect. And speaking of characters, the meat of Cassette Beast's narrative is, I believe, in the story of the partner characters. Sure, the grander plot-driven narrative mystery is there, and it's interesting, but the pieces of story that stick with me are the ones that help me to get to know Kaylee, Felix, Meredith, Viola, Barksley, and Eugene. I kept looking for some connection between the individual stories of each companion, and maybe I'm totally dumb and missed what the game was trying to say, but what I found was pretty thin. 
There's a theme in a few of the companion quests of ideas made manifest, and that is something that follows through into the overarching narrative. But except for a sentimental believe in your friend style climax that feels ripped from Pokemon, a game this one outclasses in most other ways, I didn't feel like Cassette Beasts ever did anything with that theme. And I want to be clear, this is one flaw in a game that I love in a lot of other ways. I actually really admire a lot of the writing that Jay and Tom have done here, because what this game does have are characters who are made to feel like real people, and whose personal stories that I'm actually interested in. Cassette Beast manages this in two major ways, through voice acting and through believable quest lines and backstories. Now, not every line is voice acted, but the beginning of an interaction might have the first couple words or a hearty laugh, and the character portraits feel grounded in who these people were before they arrived on New Wirral, not just who they are now that they're here. I also really appreciated the game's willingness to explore backstories that were a bit more adult. Kaylee, for example, is dealing with the guilt of having been a cult leader's second-in-command shortly after she arrived on New Wirral. Meredith is struggling to adapt to life here and is very clearly, to me at least, dealing with depression in relation to that struggle. Felix, well, he has a rather funny story, but it's ultimately about learning to embrace the art he made when he was younger rather than being embarrassed by it. I really admire Jay Bayliss and his ability to write characters that don't feel like every other boring companion character, but instead feel like living, breathing people. Like, sure, this is a monster catching game where you transform into monsters recorded on cassette tapes, but within that ridiculous premise exist fictional people that actually feel like they come from the far more normal worlds they claim to be from. I think without that diverse set of extremely well-written characters, I probably would have dropped this game after an hour or so. Certainly, there is a larger package of things working for me, but these characters are pretty critical to the experience I've had with this game. If the vibe of Cassette Beasts is meaningful complexity, then it's these characters and the way they're delivered that is the front door to that experience. You can't make Pokemon for adults if your characters don't have desire or conflict like adults do. And Cassette Beasts nails it from the moment Kaylee rescues you from your first monster encounter. She knows what it's like to be new here, and what it's like to start off on the wrong foot. And she just wants to help you survive. At the end of Pokemon Legends Arceus, like at the end of most Pokemon games, you catch God on a Pokeball. And then you seal up a rift in time and space that sent you to the ancient Hisui region, never to return back to your home. The game's not that poetic about it. I believe it mostly ends this way so the post game makes sense. But I did find it odd that the protagonist of that game would choose to stay rather than return home. There wasn't really anything keeping them there besides plot. Presumably everything and everyone they cared for was back home. I wouldn't know because Pokemon isn't really interested in fleshing out its characters for its primary audience of children. At the end of Cassette Beast though, you leave New Wirral and you return home. After an entire game about coming to terms with being stuck here, building relationships along the way, and maybe even finding romance, there's no option to let go of your quest. There's no option to stay and to let this place be home. Sure, the game's not going to force you to leave, but the only way to get narrative closure is for you and your friends to leave this place and go back to your respective homes. Cassette Beast establishes really great characters and a stellar sense of place. It uses gameplay mechanics, music, writing, and even user interface to establish a tone, a vibe. And then it doesn't at all question what any of that was for. This character, in this game, has so much here on this island that it's worth sticking around for. It just doesn't make sense to me why that wouldn't be an option. But maybe it's me that needs to let go of the idea that this game needed to say anything at all. Kyle Labriola wrote this really great piece over on Co-Host about the new game Sea of Stars, where he takes a critical look at that game's writing while praising the rest of its craft. Having not played that game, it sounds like Cassette Beast does a much better job, but like Kyle, I do expect more from games writing than I think others do. Sound, mechanics, art, performance, and every other aspect of creating a game absolutely are important, and I think Cassette Beast excels at all of those. I also think that unlike Kyle's opinion on Sea of Stars writing, Jay Bayliss and Tom Coxon have tried to say something with Cassette Beasts. They've nailed it in some very specific ways but it just didn't come together at the end for me. There is upcoming DLC for this game. Who knows what the extent of that is gonna be, and I have no doubt that I'll play it. I have no doubt that I'll continue to listen to this game's soundtrack. I ordered one of their third run of original soundtrack cassette tapes, in fact, and I wouldn't do that for a game that I didn't love. And I think you will probably love this game, especially if you don't care about all of that pretentious BS that I just went on about. Because Cassette Beasts, 
it's a fucking vibe. And if that's all it is, maybe that's okay too. 